morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our live stream worship. Uh, I'm reminded of, well, I've been thinking about that verse out of the 118th Psalm that said, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, even when it's a negative 20 degrees outside and with the wind chill a negative 40, this is still the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice, but we're going to rejoice in it from the warmth of our own homes. And so I am simply glad that we have an opportunity still as St. James and all who have chosen to come and be a part of this worship experience, uh, that we have a chance to simply find God even in the blessings of modern technology. I want to share just a couple of quick announcements with you uh, as we continue into our worship experience. I can promise you um, there isn't going to be any music because it's just me and we all know that my singing skills are not stellar, but um, just a couple of other announcements to share. Uh, first is to recognize tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so St. James will be honoring that. Uh, for those of you who are part of Janet Wilberger's Bible study, uh, you're not going to start tomorrow. We're, that's going to wait one more week. So if you have any questions, I know Janet's watching right now, uh, reach out to Janet and uh, she'll be sure to, to chat with you about it. But we're going to wait, I guess, one more week. Uh, that being said, there is also no finance committee tomorrow night, so if you are part of the finance committee, uh, we're going to bump that uh, watch for Tammy. Uh, Tammy's watching as well, and uh, we'll be reaching out, letting you know what to anticipate. And then also, our Wednesday nights, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be back to, to normal this Wednesday, which starts with tone chimes, and dinner, and children, and youth activities, and adult study, as well as uh, the chancel choir, and so practice, and so... Uh, please make sure to note all of those as we get started back to what I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm looking outside at the winter wonderland that it is and just hoping that by then maybe we'll see some positive numbers on the uh, temperature scale. But to get started uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to invite us to, as I say at 9.30, to take that breath. Simply breathe. Take whatever the world has been trying to, to stress you out with, burden you with, force you to think you have to carry it on your own. Just, just breathe. Let that exhale all that out. Let God back into those lungs. Just take that moment of just to breathe. And take a moment for breath for your family for your friends, for all who are a part of St. James. Let us breathe together as community for one another. And finally, let's say a breath and take a breath for, for ourselves, for everything that's in our hearts, that's on our minds, everything that that is a part of who we are, that we need to simply give to God and by what we need to give is all. Take this moment now, simply to be in that moment of, of quiet meditation, to lift up all that is there, to look for that peace and that wisdom, for the forgiveness and the salvation. Almighty God, I pray that you give us the wisdom we need to come up with new ideas and strategies. I ask that you keep us flexible to your plans. This year, I don't want us to be locked into just one of the ways of doing things. Help us to leave room for you to do the unexpected and for us to want to move when you say move. I trust that your plans for us are amazing. Whatever path you lead us down will take us exactly where we're supposed to be. Amen. If you have, uh, normally we'd have the ushers grabbing up those blue sheets and bringing those in. Uh, 
please feel free to email any of that uh, or feel free to, to text or send in those, those prayer requests, the joys, the concerns, anything that you would like to have uh, the staff, the pastors know about, please make sure to, to let us know and make those a part of our prayers throughout the week as well. Now, the scripture text that we have for this morning, let me get there, is one that if I were to tell you we're going to be reading a story about the leper, you would be thinking of the, the one that gets a lot more press, the, the ten lepers that, that often gets read. But in Matthew's Gospel, there is also the story of Jesus healing a leper. It, it, it doesn't get as much uh, reading. It doesn't get shared as much. But this morning, it is the focus of, of our scripture text. It's Matthew 8, 1 through 4. You're now God's word for us. When Jesus came down from the mountain, crowds followed him. Behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. I heard a funny story about this couple. They were celebrating their 60th birthday together. It just so happened, born on the, on the same day of the same year, and had always just enjoyed their birthdays together. And on their 60th, as they were celebrating, and everybody was together, the, the angel of the Lord appeared before them and said, you two have been so wonderful together, have, have done so many wonderful things together. I'm, I'm here to offer and provide for each one of you your own individual wish. The wife said, well, angel of the Lord, I, I wish that my husband and I, that, that we could travel the world together. And with that, he goes, your wish is granted. And poof, in her hands are, are tickets that allow them to to travel the world, to see all of the amazing things. The angel of the Lord turns and looks at the husband, and he notices the husband is, isn't quite looking up quite so much at the, at, at the angel, and the angel of the Lord says to the husband, well, what is it you wish for? And the husband said, well, I, that really wasn't what I was thinking for. He goes, well, uh, my wish is that I was married to a woman 30 years younger than me. Angel of the Lord said, as you wish. And poof! The man was 90. <laughs> so, be careful what you wish for. In our gospel lesson this morning, I think it's important that we all start out by realizing and recognizing that if you had leprosy back in Jesus' day, even to this day, it, it is a major medical issue. But back then, uh, you weren't allowed to be in the cities. You weren't allowed to be in the towns. You, you weren't allowed to live even with, with your family anymore. If you were found to be unclean with leprosy, you had to go and live within those colonies, within those communities. And the only way you could come out is if you could prove to the, to the church, literally to the, the Pharisees, that, that you had been cleansed. That was the only way you were allowed to go back you live in your way, and for almost everyone, that, that rarely ever happened. And what's interesting about our text today is it points out Jesus is coming down the mountain, which, for those of us who are wondering what that means, Jesus has just done Sermon on the Mount, okay? Fifth chapter of Matthew, blessed, you know. And, and as they're coming down the mountain, which means Jesus isn't in a town. He isn't in a city. He's simply out in the country preaching. And it's with that, that that this leper was able to get close enough to be able to hear Jesus. He, he, he couldn't be in, in the crowd. He, he, he wasn't allowed to do that. Community laws forbade him from doing that. But as he was there and able to hear, you, you know there were those, even within his circle, that were saying, oh, we can't get too close. Oh, you know, we shouldn't be here. You know, 
people are going to start pointing out that, that, that this is wrong. We, we shouldn't be standing this close. We, we need to back up. We need to get away before anybody notices us. But he stays and he listens. Not only listens, but he hears and he understands. He understands because as soon as Jesus comes walking down, even though he hasn't gotten close enough yet to Jesus, he starts calling to Jesus. He starts asking because he knows Jesus is the Messiah. He knows Jesus is the Savior. And he knows that Jesus can heal him of his leprosy. He knows that all he need do is simply call out to him. And he does. He said, Lord, if you, if you will, you can make me clean. He had faith as, as an individual, a, a belief in that even though everybody else was saying, don't do that, don't go there, don't, don't try that. He was willing to, to take that step. To, to break through that barrier, if, if you will, that, that bond that society sometimes tries to, to place on us. He, he's willing to, to let go of all of that, to break through that, to ask Jesus to perform this miracle. And what happens? And Jesus stretched out his hand, which means at some point in the midst of this leper saying that to him, their distance has closed. They have gotten close to one another. They're, they're, they're literally, they're so close, Jesus literally then reaches out to him, recognizes this man's faith, understands what this man is asking for, and with that he reaches out and says, I will. I will make you clean. And he reaches out and he heals him. What an amazing thing, because, you, you know, in that day, in that age, you, you, if you were clean, if you did not have leprosy, touching a leper was, even if you didn't show signs, you then had to prove to everyone that you were not a leper. And you see, Jesus wasn't held to that barrier, to that, to that societal bond. He, he, he knew what he had the ability to do, and what he had the ability to do was to heal, was to show mercy was to show love and compassion and, and, and forgiveness. And he reaches out and he says, I will. What an amazing statement. It, it's not, hey, when there's not tens of thousands of people around us and nobody's really looking, yeah, come on back over and, and I'll do that. No, he goes, I will. And in that, he makes him clean. Touches him. What's interesting, though, is, is what Jesus says to him next, and it, it, it shouldn't be lost on that. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourselves to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now, why not tell anybody? You know, he's just come down off the mountain. There are a lot of people who've already seen what he is capable of, listened to his, his preaching, and, and now see this miracle. Why not tell how this has come to be until after they have recognized him as being clean, as being able to come back into the society? Well, I think the rationale for that is, is that Jesus already was on the Pharisees' radar. You know, the, 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 the Jewish... Culture, the, the Roman authorities, they had already begun to note who Jesus is. And so I think what Jesus was trying to say to, to this leper, now clean, was don't tell them how this has come to be. Because if you do that, you might not get the proof that you need. You may not get the, the seal of approval because they won't give it to you simply because you said, well, that guy Jesus healed me. And so they may not let you back into town, even though you're healed, even though you're clean, they may not give that to you simply because of the fact that I'm the one who healed you. And, and so with that, the man goes and presents himself. And, and I mean, this goes all the way back. Jesus is saying, you know, we've got to go all the way back to Moses. That, that's how old the rules are, even though we're 
thousands of years past that. We still have to live by, by this until the moment that I show you we don't have to live by that anymore. But within that barrier that society had placed, Jesus even understood to break through that barrier, to release that bond of leprosy, they still had to, to do this particular piece. When we come into today, there are these barriers, these, these bonds society still tries to put on us. And, you know, I don't know how many of you uh, remember this phrase, but uh, my, my family loves to, to point out that I remember just about every catchphrase <laughs> that ever existed, but there's that one, if you could only walk a mile in their shoes. You know, the thing about that is, is that the invitation is there, it's metaphorical, obviously. Because the simple truth is no one is necessarily walking in our shoes. Our path is our path. How we journey, how we walk is, is unique to each one of us. It, it, it is that unique reality of even how God has created each one of us in terms of how unique we are. The journey is just that unique for each one of us. And, and so I would invite us to think about that, to, 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 to recognize that our journey is unique. I came across a story that I think kind of helps bring the, the leper story in, into the modern day, and there's a story of a boy named Jack. This is a true story. will not make light of what happens to him, especially at the beginning. Jack was a sixth grader at the time and was waiting for the bus. And in the midst of a, a tragic accident, the bus hits him, breaks both of his legs, does significant damage to his legs. They, they get him to the hospital and begin to, to work through the process of, of healing Jack's body. Well, as they are in the hospital and as they're taking that time, the, the doctors and the nurses begin to tell Jack and, and Jack's parents, he's going to come back to a, a full recovery. It, it's going to take a long time. But that there's no reason, excuse me, there's no reason to believe that Jack isn't going to be healthy and whole again. Well, as much as Jack was hearing that, as much as Jack's parents were healing, hearing that, Jack's parents were dealing with their own guilt of not being at that bus stop, as if somehow they could magically back up and, and protect Jack, and they were dealing with their own guilt and, and, and dealing with wanting to make sure their son was cared for and, and healed. And, and they started pointing out to Jack, well, Jack, you know, be careful what you hear the doctors and nurses saying to you. You know, you, you, you're going to be in a wheelchair. Um, you know, you, you're not going to be able to play your favorite sport, soccer. You're not going to get out, go out to recess and, and play. You, you, you may not be able to do those things. But the doctors and the nurses kept saying, you're going to be fully healed, but they came. Jack to get to leave the hospital, and, and as they're wheeling Jack out, Mom and Dad have been talking about how to, to help Jack, to take care of Jack, and, and they had decided, Mom and Dad, and, and again, as a parent, we all, as, as adults for the children that we care for and love, whether they are biological or, or children that our parent or that God has brought into, into our lives, nieces, nephews, uh, neighbors, uh, all of those children, those who are, we might teach at school. You know, they had decided they knew what was best for Jack, and what they decided was best for Jack was the mom was going to be the stay-at-home mom, and she was going to just homeschool Jack. That that hearing a bus might send Jack back into these negative post-traumatic experiences, and they didn't want that for Jack. They, they also didn't want Jack going to school for, for fear of being bullied and, and kids making fun of him and, and Jack feeling bad that he couldn't get out of the wheelchair. And so they decided Jack would stay home. And, and the mom would, every morning, they'd, they'd get up and, and, and Jack would get taught and, and they'd get done with all their stuff by lunch. And so in the afternoons, what Jack would simply do was sit, watch TV play video games. Didn't really interact with anyone. The, the 
friends really weren't invited to come by. Nobody was really, you know, allowed to come and spend time with Jack. And Jack's parents began to notice that they're their, their fun-loving, full-of-energy, uh, good-natured son was, was slowly becoming reserved, sullen, sad, depressed. And, and they were worried that, you know, what had happened, that, that accident was taking a, that mental toll on Jack, and so they, they then moved to deciding that Jack needed to go and see a counselor. Good choice. But they went in and, and met with the counselor first and, and said to the counselor, well, we, we need you to be careful here, counselor. Uh, we, we don't know what's going on with our son, but we think because of the fuss, and they begin to explain what happened and, and Jack getting hit and, and all of these things that take place. You know, They were that group that was saying, oh, these are, these are the boundaries, these are the barriers. You know, the, the, these are the these are the places that you got to stop. You can't go any farther. The counselor, the good counselor, heard the parents. The parents said, "Well, these are the things we want you to, to do and, and focus on." But the counselor simply listened, never acknowledged what the parents were looking for. They came for Jack to come in, and and as Jack was being wheeled in, the the parents had told the counselor how they really wanted the counselor to engage Jack. The counselor. <laughs> The counselor did what the counselor was supposed to do and looked at Jack as soon as Jack came and got this big smile on my face and said, I have been so excited, I'm so looking forward to the boy who beat the bus. Not the, not the boy that got hit by the bus. Not, not, not the boy who, who had a, a, a terrible accident. No, the counselor said, I have always wanted to meet someone who beat the bus. And all of a sudden, Something clicked in Jack's mind. You see, he, he, he was willing to break through this, this barrier, this bond that said, oh, you know, I, this tragedy of, of being hit by the bus. Instead, the counselor starts to invite Jack to look at it from a different point of view. It, yes, it happened. But you know what? You beat the bus. And together, the counselor and Jack started to look at how, you know what? You overcame. You, you you did something that you know nobody else is going to try, and you succeeded. You beat the bus, and they began to to write a, a book, and 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 presenting Jack in, in in actually a superhero kind of way. You know that that whatever his favorite comic book character was, Batman, Superman, you know, Green Lantern, Green Lantern, whatever it was, Aquaman, but started to to present him as the one who not only survived it, but he beat it, he overcame it, and he was finding a new path in life because of it, and, and had created this book. And, and in the midst of the counseling, all of a sudden, the parents started to see their, their Jack come back. That, that fun-loving, full of energy, good-natured, uh, wanting-to-get-going young man that, that they'd always known him for. And, and they began to meet with the counselor too, and the counselor began to help them understand that what Jack needed wasn't to be at home. Well, completely understand, parents want to protect children. That we as adults, that's what we should be wanting to do. But the counselor was pointing out that Jack needed to be able and be allowed to get back into society again, to feel that that healing touch that allows him to go back. And so the parents met with the school. And they began to work with the school to figure out how to make sure while Jack was still having to be in the wheelchair at that time, the anticipation was the day was going to come when he didn't need it anymore, but they needed it at that moment. How the, how the school was going to help make sure Jack was able to come back to school. How the bus was going to pick him up and get him there. And, and even once Jack started going back to school, the parents had published Jack's book and, you know, photocopied it, whatever it was, and Jack was allowed to take it and share it with all of his friends how he had beaten the bus. He had overcome that barrier. He had broken through that bond of trying to be held down and how he had grown and moved forward from it. See, there are things in our lives, each one of us, that tries to tell us, oh, huh, 
No, can't do that. Can't say that. Can't think that. Can't live that. Can't talk to that person. No, that option is not on the table for you. That you know, we'll try to to put us in a box. We'll try to put these bonds on us. Try to tell us we're like the leper and stand there and go, oh, don't get too close. But you see, the shoes that we walk in, they're our shoes. Nobody else can, can walk in our shoes. We have to embrace our journey uniquely. Now, that doesn't mean we don't listen to what people have to say. That doesn't mean we don't receive advice. I mean, it's important to hear what others have to say. Some are going to tell you what they think because that's what they think. And some are going to share because they hope that that will be helpful to you. We have to be willing to, to discern and to listen and, and to take all of that. And, and, and in the midst of what the world is trying and our friends are trying and our parents and, and all these people around us, our colleagues, our co-workers, people we're with at church, is to weigh all of that in the midst of, of who Jesus is calling us be, to recognizing that Jesus is looking at us and is saying, I will care for you, and touches us, and helps us to, to break that bond. Because see, the danger that we run into is, is that if we don't engage Jesus, we'll get caught up in, in, in like Jack, we'll get in that, that self-pity, and, and we'll think, you know, I can't do it, or I won't do it, or, or we just lose that person that we own. No, that, that, that shine in our eyes. You know? Let me remind us that even in the midst of a great day, self-pity will try and come and get us. And, and when, when those things start to try to happen, and we remember we are walking in our shoes, remember the gratitude. Have gratitude for where we are right now. It, it can be very little. I mean, it can be as simple as, hey, we're on, we're on live stream right now. We're, we're having worship together. Maybe not in person, but you know what? I'm grateful that we are a community that gets together even right now. Find those things that, that Christ has placed into your heart to let you know the greatness of who you are. Of the amazing things that you can do. That while society might try to tell you this is who you are, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, Christ is saying, I am making you right. We together can do all things good and great. Together we move forward. So, as we move forward today, <laughs> recognizing it is cold outside, we move with Christ. We move as individuals. We move as a community who understands our uniqueness, but how together in our uniqueness, our community continues to show the love of God, recognizing that you know what? God has made each and every single one of us special and unique. Embrace that. Release the barrier. Let go of the bonds. Remember who God has called you to be. Would you pray with me, gracious God? I take this moment and thank you. I thank you that, that you have called us and created us and made us and, and have put thoughts and ideas in our minds and in our hearts, have given us a faith that lets us understand that as we come into this new year, as we continue moving forward into who you call and create us to be, we embrace that. We don't get locked into one thing, but we continue to be all things that you invite us to be. We be your children. Amen. I hope you all have a wonderful and great day. Have a wonderful week. I, Pastor Michel Crystal, all of the staff, look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. I'm hoping it's a little warmer. You don't have to count on me and my ability to do technology. We'll be blessed with, with music and, and voices and our opportunity to be together in our, in our sanctuaries again. Have a wonderful and blessed day.